and welcome to The Fix, the podcast about Photoshop, Lightroom, post-processing, and all the cool and creative things we get to do with our images after the shoot. I'm Sean Duggan, and in this episode, we're going to focus on a single project where I'm going to show you how to make a cinemagraph in Photoshop. But I'm going to take it a little bit farther, and we're going to apply some additional Photoshop effects to create a more customized version of the image and take it beyond the basic cinemagraph. Thanks for tuning in and joining me. We are in the final week of 2015. We're cruising into a new year in just a few days. Uh, and as I mentioned in the intro, uh, in this episode, it's a project-based show. I'm going to just sort of work on a single image, a single project. And I'm going to be tackling the cinemagraph format, how to create a cinemagraph in Photoshop. Now, there are other programs out there that allow you to make cinemagraphs. There are several that are available for uh, smartphones that allow you to take a clip of video that you've taken with your smartphone and kind of turn it into a cin cinemagraph right there on the phone. Uh, and there's even, uh, you know, desktop uh, computer applications that allow you to do that. But my focus here is to show you how to do it in a program that you probably already have if you're a regular watcher of this show, and that would be Photoshop. So uh, let's tackle definitions. What is a cinemagraph? Well, if you don't already know, it essentially is a combination of a still image with a video image. So you have um, what looks to be a, a nicely composed lit still photograph, but within that still photograph, there's a little bit of the scene that is in motion and it's constantly in motion. So that is where uh, the animated GIF part of it comes in. But a cinemagraph is a little bit more than an animated GIF. It's a little bit more sophisticated and elegant because typically the ones that are well done anyway combine the hallmarks of you know, good photographic composition, nice lighting, uh, and sometimes even the hint of a story, a little bit of mystery. Um, and when done well, they can be quite engaging and quite fun to not only create, but also to watch. So some classic examples I've seen are uh, a really nicely composed uh, kitchen scene, beautiful light coming in, and there's a tea kettle on the stove with uh, steam coming up, and the steam is in motion. Or there's a, uh, a young woman and the wind is ruffling her hair or the hem of her dress, something like that. Um, or these examples here that I, I came up with last week. Here's my two dogs uh, hanging out in front of the fire, just kind of like snoozing. And, you know, we have the dog in the background there who's just kind of opening her sleepy eyes to look at me. And, you know, it's such a subtle motion there that it looks really nice because at first it looks like you know, nothing's happening. And then you see her eyes open. Or this one here, which is, you know, quite a bit different, a little bit more surreal. Uh, this one actually is a combination of a cinemagraph with, you know, a more uh, fantastic composite scene suggesting, you know, something out of Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings or something like that. And by the way, the reason that I made this strange surrealistic composite here is that I'm going to be presenting at Photo Fusion in West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, in mid-January, January 19th through the 23rd. And one of the classes that I'm going to be doing is a three-hour masterclass computer workshop on creating imaginary landscapes using Photoshop compositing techniques. So if you are uh, going to be in the West Palm Beach, Florida area uh, that week, January 19th through the 23rd, uh, and that is of interest to you, um, consider stopping by and joining me. Uh, you can go to photofusion.org for more information, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. So in terms of what you need to make a cinemagraph, you just need a camera that can shoot some video. And it can be pretty much any kind of camera, as long as it can shoot video. It can be a smartphone, a uh, DSLR, a uh, micro for thirds camera, uh, a mirrorless camera. It doesn't really matter. You just need to have a camera that can shoot video. You need to have a camera on a tripod. That's very, very important because the camera does need to be immobile. And you also need to have um, motion that lends itself well to the whole cinemagraph aesthetic. So you know, think of motion that can um, appear subtle, um, 
And that can also be repeated kind of infinitely on this loop and appear natural. So, you know, the examples that I mentioned earlier, the steam rising from the kettle, the wind blowing the woman's hair, um, the one of my dog just kind of opening her sleepy eyes, the little waterfall in that kind of surreal uh, landscape composite that I showed. Things like that all work very well for cinemagraphs. I've also seen ones where um, the, the motion happens, you know, only once every few seconds. I saw one uh, of a, a man reading a book. and It was in black and white, had a real sort of film noir feel to it. And you're looking uh, over his shoulder down at him as he's reading a book. It's very still and very static. It's well composed, looks really cool. And then suddenly, you know, after several seconds, his hand reaches out and turns a page. Really, really effective. Things that don't work well for cinemagraphs are uh, scenes where there's an obvious uh, starting and ending point to the motion. So if you imagine, um, you know, a football game and the football players running across the field, that's not going to work well because there's a real obvious uh, point where the video starts and where the action stops. And if you try to loop that, there's just going to be this real kind of a disconcerting, you know, jar uh, between the start and the stop of the video. So. Uh, think of scenes where there can be motion that appears natural when uh, it's looped infinitely. And that is basically it. And, and of course, also applying, you know, uh, all of the things that you would normally want to uh, think of when you're making a photograph. Good composition, good light, perhaps a sense of story, things like that. All right. Well, without further ado, let's dive in and take a look at how you make a cinemagraph in Photoshop and how we can go beyond the basic cinemagraph. Before we dive into Photoshop and start creating the cinemagraph, let's just take a quick look at the video that I'm going to be using. So it's Christmas time. We have lots of Christmas paraphernalia around the house. So I set up this nutcracker in front of our fireplace and made a short video clip of it. So I've got three areas of potential motion that I could use here. There's the fire in the background on the left side. There's obviously the hair of the nutcracker, which is being ruffled by a small oscillating fan that I had nearby. And then there's the reflection of the fire in the glass door over on the right side of the video. So I think what I want to do is I want to have the fire in the background on the left be still and not moving, but I do want to have the reflection of the fire and the nutcracker's hair be moving in the cinemagraph. Because I found that some of the most effective cinemagraphs combine areas of you know, obvious motion where there's something that is moving in the scene, but it's rendered still as in a still photograph, combining that with actual motion that is, you know, rendered and reproduced via the cinemagraph effect. So that's my plan here for this. Let's dive over to Photoshop and get to work. So I've already opened the video file into Photoshop. And you can open a video file into Photoshop the same way you would any other type of file. Just go to the file menu, choose open, and navigate out to where the file is. If you're on a Mac, you can also find the file and drag it onto the Photoshop icon in the dock, and that is another way to bring a file into Photoshop. So let me point out here before we get into this that I'm currently using the Motion Workspace for this. And the primary advantage of the Motion Workspace is that it allows me access to the timeline panel, which you can see down here at the bottom of the interface. And you can find the motion workspace by going up to the window menu and choosing workspace, motion. The next thing to point out is that when you do open up a video file into Photoshop, Photoshop will place it into a video group here in the layers panel. And we can tell that this is a video layer because it has this little uh, film strip icon here down in the lower corner of the thumbnail. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to identify the area in the video that I want to use for my still frame. Now I could use pretty much anything here as the still frame, and mainly I'm concerned with what the fire in the background looks like. So let me just come down here to the timeline panel and grab the playhead, which is this little blue slider with a little red line on it, and let me just move that and see if I can find uh, an area where the flames look good and, and particularly flamey. Uh, that's a technical term there, flamey. That looks pretty good right there. So what I'm going to do now is I am going to make a copy of this frame that is currently visible and turn it into a new layer. And to do that, I'm going to use a shortcut, and that shortcut is Command 
Option Shift E. That would be Control Alt Shift E on Windows. And you can see here in the Layers panel that it has created a brand new layer currently called layer two. And we know that it is a regular layer, a still layer and not a video layer because it does not have the little film strip icon down in the corner. I'm gonna double click on the layer name here and I'll just call this still. So I know that that's the still image. Now, the other thing that I wanna point out is, let me actually move my timeline panel up a bit so we can see the bottom of it. If I scroll here in the timeline panel, you can see that when the new layer was created, the still layer, it placed it after the first layer. Let me actually make that a little bit smaller here by adjusting the uh, zoom slider for this timeline panel. So this slider here between the two mountains, it zooms in and out of the timeline panel, not the actual image. So that allows you to get in really close, and there are times when you do need it to get in really close in the timeline panel. So when you have layers that are in a video group, they are arranged sequentially. So first I have the video layer, because that is what was there first, and then when I added the new layer, it's placed after the video layer. So for the effect that we're gonna do, I need to have this out of the video group, because it needs to be up on top of this video layer here in the timeline panel. It needs to cover up the video layer for uh, the cinemagraph effect. So I'm gonna take that, in the layers panel here. I'm just gonna drag it up out of that video group. And then when I see the, the solid line, not, not the box, because if I see the box, that means it's just gonna go back into the video group. But when I see the solid line appear above that, I can let go. And there you can see it's out of the video group. And here we can see it's out of the video group here in the timeline panel and up on its own track. So I'm gonna move this down to the beginning here, place it right there. And temporarily, I'm just gonna turn the visibility for this still layer off, because now what I need to do is identify the area of the video that has the, the motion that I want. And also, this is actually a good point to pause and discuss some of the things that will affect the final file size of our Cinemagraph file that we save out here at the end of the process. So this video clip here is only about nine seconds long. It's very, very short. But we don't really need a lot here. In terms of the file size, the things that are gonna affect the file size of a uh, GIF file, or a GIF file, if you wanna pronounce it that way, are the pixel dimensions of the image or of the video. That is, how many pixels wide by how many pixels tall it is. Also, the frame rate of the video. So this video here is currently 30 frames per second. But if you had shot a video using a higher frame rate, so for instance, on some cameras, you can shoot at 60 frames a second. Uh, and if you're shooting with an iPhone, uh, you can do super slow-mo and maybe go up to 240 frames a second. So that is all gonna increase your size because there's more frames per second. The other thing that's gonna affect the file size of the GIF files that you create is how many colors are in the file because the GIF file format can support at most 256 colors. So in terms of shooting video, be aware that if you are shooting at a higher frame rate, such as 60 frames per second, 120, 240 frames per second, it is definitely going to impact the file size of the final GIF that you create. In terms of selecting how many colors are used when the final GIF file is created, that's something that we're gonna do at the end of the process. Plus, we can also uh, factor in the size, the pixel dimensions of the file at the end of the process as well. Currently, this is a 1080p image, so it's 1920 pixels wide by 1080 pixels high. We will not be saving it out at that size for the final version, because that'll be a little bit too large. We're gonna make it probably half that size. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna come down to the timeline panel, and I'm going to scrub through this to find a point where the hair starts to blow. So right about there, it looks like. I'm right here about three seconds, 17 frames. And by the way, this counter down here at the bottom left of the timeline panel, the, the first number there is seconds, and then the second number is frames. So you can see as I scrub up here, it'll get up to 30, and then it'll reset to uh, zero and then one. 
you can see right there, went from 330, 329, then to 330, then to 4. And that's because, of course, as I mentioned, this video is shot at 30 frames per second. So I only need a couple of seconds for this. Again, the reason I'm choosing to, to use only a couple seconds of motion from this is because two seconds is going to be 60 frames. And the more frames that I have, the larger my final GIF file will be. So let me just start here at about a four second mark, I guess, and see what it looks like when I get out to the six second mark. So I think that that gives me plenty of motion there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to position my playhead here at the four second mark. And I'm going to click on that video track to make it active. I'm going to place my cursor on the left side and notice how the cursor changes there. So I can actually grab that left side there and then drag in. And what's nice is you get this little pop-up window which shows you uh, the video playing there. So if you needed to judge how much to trim this, you can actually base your decision on what you're seeing in that window. I'm just going to go right to the playhead there. And notice that when I let go, it snapped the video track back to the beginning. So that's what happens when you have a video in a video group, is that it is going to snug up to the beginning there, uh, or if you have other tracks in there, it'll snug up to the track uh, right before it. So next what I'm going to do is move my cursor here to about the two second mark, because since I trimmed it at the four second mark, that is now the one second mark, you know, the, the, the start of the video here. So I'm going to come in two seconds here to right about there. And I'm going to trim the right side. Again, I'll place my cursor here at the end and drag in to right there. Now, let me point out that this uh, trimming action here is not really a trim in the literal sense of the word because I'm not actually cutting off those areas after, you know, where I place the, the end of the, the clip. It's just sort of hiding it or, or masking it out. So all of the original nine seconds of that video is still there. I've just basically shortened it down so we're only seeing two seconds of the total nine second length. But I can always get back and retrieve any of that simply by, you know, dragging this out here and stretching it out again. All right, let me click on the still layer here and let me shorten it so it is the same length as the video. Now what I need to do is mask the still layer so that we can see through it because if I turn the eye icon on for that layer to make it visible and I scrub through it, now we don't see any motion because of course that still layer is on top of the video and it's hiding it. So, with that layer active here in the Layers panel, I'm going to come down and click on the Add Layer Mask button in the bottom of the Layers panel. Now I have a layer mask here. It's active because I have the highlight border around it there. I'm going to get my Brush Tool, which is B on the keyboard, and I'm going to paint with black. So right now, black is my background color, so I'll just press X on the keyboard to exchange those colors and make black the foreground color. Now, I'm going to paint at 100% opacity. So I'm going to change my opacity for my brush. Right now my brush is at 20% opacity because it, that's what it was set to the last time I was using it. Uh, and, and by the way, whenever you use any tool in Photoshop, it is a good idea to just kind of cast your eye up there to the options bar to see what the options are set to. Because in many cases, those options are uh, sticky, meaning that they'll stick around uh, until you come and change them again. So I'm going to just press zero on the keyboard to set that brush opacity to 100%. And I'm going to paint on the mask here to hide the still layer in that part of the, of the image there. Now, one way you can see what you're doing in terms of where you're painting is that if you press the backslash key, you'll get a little red overlay which shows you where you're painting. And that backslash key is uh, right below the delete key or right above the return key on the right side of the keyboard there. And I think what I'll do is I'll also paint out here on the goatee, the hipster goatee that our Nutcracker has, the original hipster here. 
And then, of course, I want to paint on the uh, reflection of the fire in the glass door of the, of the wood-burning stove. So something like that looks pretty good. Let me actually lower my opacity down to about 30%, and I'll kind of feather this a little bit so it's you know, not totally a hard, distinct edge there. All right, that looks pretty good. And let me just tap the backspace key again to turn that off. And if I turn off the visibility of the video layer underneath, you can see that this mask here on this layer where it's black is hiding that layer, which is gonna allow us to see the video underneath. So let's get a preview of what this is looking like. I'm gonna come down to the left side of the timeline panel here, and I'm gonna click on this little gear icon here. And there's an option there to loop the playback. Now I already have that checked because I've been playing with this here, uh, but make sure that that is checked because that will allow you to sort of get a preview of what it would look like as a uh, infinitely looped uh, animated GIF file. Now, I'm going to use a keyboard shortcut to play this, but let me also point this out. If you come to the right side of the timeline panel, there's this little icon here which opens up the panel menu, and every panel in Photoshop has its own little panel menu, and that just contains additional options and choices that are specific to that panel, but there is an option here for enable timeline shortcut keys. And what that allows you to do is press the arrow keys on the keyboard to move one frame at a time. So I'm pressing the left or right arrow keys to move this one frame at a time. But it also allows you to use the space bar to play and then pause the video. So we can see that this is what our basic effect is. It's looking pretty good, actually. I, I kind of like this. Um, overall, that, that, that's it. There, there's one other effect I'm gonna show you here, however, that could be potentially useful depending on the type of uh, motion you have in your scene. And what that is, is sometimes you might have a video where there's a jump, an obvious kind of visual jump between the start of the video and the end of the video. And so sometimes it's nice to try to camouflage that so it looks a little bit more seamless. In this case here, I probably don't need it, but I'm going to show it to you anyway because it's really useful because in some situations, it will come in very, very handy. So in order to create a seamless transition between the start of your video and the end of the video so that there's no obvious jumping in motion, what I need to do is arrange it so that the first frame of my video is also the last frame of my video. So let me zoom in to the timeline panel here. I'm gonna zoom in really close. And I'm gonna use this shortcut key that I just mentioned, the arrow keys on the keyboard to move the playhead one frame at a time. So I'll just tap on the right arrow key and it comes in one frame. And so you can see that when we're zoomed all the way in here, one frame is essentially the size of that little thumbnail there at the beginning of the clip. Here's two frames, three frames, etc. So I'm going to set that back to the start. I'm going to zoom back out a little bit. And what I'm going to do is I want to make a copy of this first video layer here. But what I want to do is keep it in a separate group. So I'm actually going to make a copy of the group. So I'm just going to right click on the video group and I'll just choose duplicate group. And I'm just going to call this video group seamless and actually let me rename that layer in there because it is the same name as the other one so we'll just call this uh seamless all right so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to take this seamless layer here and i'm going to move this down to the very end i'm going to place my playhead there by clicking on the little number scale up here at the top and then i'm going to zoom all the way in so when you zoom in it will always zoom in to where your playhead is. So if you want to go in to look at a certain area, you need to make sure your playhead is active on that spot. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to place this at the very end here. So now the very first frame of the video is appearing at the end. Okay, so that's step one. 
But what I need to do now is I need to extend this out because I want to create a gradual fade into that first frame so that as the video is playing, it's going to gradually fade. And by the time it gets to the end of the video on this bottom track, the original track, it actually is going to fade into the first frame again, which is going to totally match the real first frame, you know, back over here at the beginning of the original clip. All right. So remember when I originally kind of trimmed these video clips, it's not a destructive act. So all the original video is still there. So I'm actually going to grab this left end here of the seamless clip and stretch it out a bit. And yeah, that's going to give me a, a fade of several frames there into that. And maybe not that much. Something like that looks pretty good. So I'm going to now place my playhead at the beginning of that clip there, the clip that I have labeled seamless. And I'm going to come over to the layers panel and I'm going to lower the opacity of that layer to zero so it doesn't show at all. And then I'm going to come over to the left side of the timeline panel and I'm going to open up the options here for that video group, the seamless video group here. So right here, I can click on that and open that up. And you'll see that I've got uh, some choices of things that I can do here. This pertains to adding keyframes to a layer. So a keyframe is something that records the attributes of the layer at a certain point in time, at a certain point in the timeline panel. And then I can move the playhead down a bit, change those attributes, and add another keyframe, and it'll create a nice little even fade from, for instance, 0% layer opacity, which is what I have now, to 100% layer opacity. So in order to add a keyframe for opacity, I'm going to click on the little stopwatch button here for opacity. And you'll see here in the timeline panel, it's added a little keyframe, that little yellow diamond there. That's our first keyframe. And it is recording that the opacity for this layer is zero. Now what I'm going to do is move the playhead back to the where the last frame is going to be. And I will now raise the opacity for this layer to 100%. And notice that it has added a new keyframe automatically. So whenever there's a keyframe that you've added manually, whenever you change something about that attribute, in this case, it's the opacity, Photoshop's going to automatically add a new keyframe to record that new change. So now if I look at this here, you can see that it does say 100% here. If I move that playhead back, now it says 50%. And of course, if I come back down here, it's going to be you know, quite low, 17%, etc. All right, so now we have that in place. Let me zoom out in the timeline panel so I can see this better. And now I just want to um, trim the right side of the seamless video clip here just to sort of bring it back so it ends where the other video clips end, just like that. So that's looking good. Let's now play this. So I will just press the space bar to start the playing. And let's see if we can notice anything. It looks pretty good. Of course, you know, it looked pretty good before just because of the way the hair was moving. But if you do have a video clip where there's an obvious jump in the motion um, between the start and the end, this is uh, one way that you can potentially deal with that and kind of hide it. Of course, how successful this is going to be really depends on the type of motion uh, in your video. There's going to be some sorts of motion where it's not going to work that well. But for things that are kind of very repetitive and, and, and the same kind of motion over and over again, it does work very, very well to create that seamless effect. Now, by the way, let me point out one other thing in here. If we look at the timeline panel, you'll see that there's this blue line here. That blue line indicates that there's a, a RAM preview or the video clip loaded into RAM. When you first start playing a video clip, it may play kind of slow and a little bit sluggishly, maybe a little bit jerkingly and haltingly. And you'll notice that the blue line does not extend all the way across the video clip. In fact, it may look like it's just kind of like following the red uh, timeline here as the timeline extends through the length of the video. So that's normal, and uh, as we'll see here a little bit later, once we start to add some more elements in here, sometimes you have to wait and it has to kind of go through one full pass before it builds up a RAM preview. So that is the basic cinemagraph effect there. 
Uh, of course, the one step that we haven't done yet is to export this out in a format that can be easily shared on the web. But we're going to get to that in a little bit. First, I'm going to go beyond the basic cinema graph and do a couple of other things to stylize this image and make it look a little bit cooler. The first thing I want to do is add a black and white layer. So I'm going to click on the top layer here, which is the still layer, and I'll come down to the bottom of the layers panel and I'll click the add adjustment layer button. I'll choose black and white, and I'm gonna make a few little adjustments here just to make the Nutcracker look better. Raise the yellows up, maybe bring the red up a bit. And you know, the Nutcracker is actually gonna end up being in color or, or kind of a more of a muted color. So it doesn't really matter too much, uh, the adjustments I make here, but I just wanted to make him look a little bit better. Also, just to see what it looks like as black and white. Actually, I think it looks pretty good in black and white. All right, that's good. For now. Now what I want to do is modify the layer mask here. So I'll get my brush tool. I'm going to be painting with black and I'm going to be painting maybe at about 60% opacity and I'm just going to paint over the Nutcracker's face. And I'm not going to paint on the Nutcracker's hair because I want that to kind of remain in black and white. Let's kind of do the, the helmet up here. And these two little dots up there. Maybe go over the helmet one more time just because the, the, there's that nice uh, gold decoration up there. And let's go over the uniform and bring that in. Okay, that's looking pretty good. And get the arm in here. And I think what I'm going to do is lower my opacity a little bit, maybe to 20% and paint a little bit over the edge here. Let me actually press X to undo that. Now I'll paint with 20%, a little bit over the face where the, I know the hair is kind of blowing over the edge of the face. All right. So that looks pretty good. A little bit of a edge here I need to bring in. And I also want to mask out the black and white effect on the reflection of the fire in the glass door here of the wood stove. So again, I'm painting in at a lower opacity there. That looks pretty good. Overall, I like that. Let's just press the space bar and, and run that. looks cool. I really like having the uh, the reflection of the fire in color there because it kind of draws a little bit more attention to it. Really like the way that's looking. All right, one more thing I want to do here is I do want to add an adjustment layer that kind of brightens up some of this uh, fire reflection a bit. So I'm just going to use the lasso tool to make a really rough selection here of that. I'm going to add a curves adjustment layer for that. And I'm just going to pull up on that curve a bit to, to brighten that and maybe down on the darker edge of the curve to keep that nice and dark. Or rather, keep the, the shadow parts of that nice and dark. There we go. That actually looks pretty nice. Of course, I have this ugly hard edge because I had a uh, zero feather on the lasso tool. So I'll come and click on the mask button here at the top of the properties panel for that curve. And then I'll just increase the feather to soften that down. And again, I'll press spacebar to play that. And that's looking pretty good. I like it. So overall, this is looking great. I certainly could export this out, but I want to play around a little bit more. Plus, that allows me the opportunity to show you another cool thing we can do. I'm going to turn the still layer into a smart object here because I want to apply a blurring filter. And by first turning the layer into a smart object, I can apply that blurring non-destructively. So I'm going to right click on the layer here and just choose convert to smart object. The layer mask disappears here, but it's not really gone. It's just inside the smart object. And now what I'll do is I'll come up to the filter menu and I'm going to choose blur gallery, iris blur. And I'm going to come over here to the right side of this ellipse here. There's a little tiny dot there, and I'm going to position my cursor on that, and I can then rotate that into more of a vertical position, and then 
drag this over the nutcracker. So that's looking pretty good. I kind of like the fact that the, the helmet's starting to get out of focus, and I like the fact that the bottom part of the nutcracker is slightly out of focus. So these inner dots that you see here, that is kind of the feather of the blur. Everything inside these four inner white dots is going to be totally in focus. And then it's going to start to gradually transition to being out of focus. And by the time it gets to the edge of the elliptical shape here, uh, it's going to be totally out of focus. I can come here to this little center wheel and grab this and, and modify the blur that way. I don't want it to be super blurry, but just a little bit blurry, I think. Let me like a blur value of about, oh, maybe 10 looks pretty good. And I'll just click OK. All right, so let's take stock here. And I'm going to press the um, space bar here to get the video plane. And as I do that, pay attention to what happens to that blue line that I referenced earlier that's going to be following the playhead. Because I added a new effect since I last played this, it's going to have to catch up and kind of re-render a new RAM preview. So you can see that the blue line there is chasing the playhead, and now it's caught up, and now it has that RAM preview. So everything looks pretty good, except for one thing, and it's kind of, kind of subtle and easy, easy to miss here. So the blur in the background looks really great. I really like that. But notice that the reflection of the fire is not as blurry <laughs> as, you know, the door around it or even the fireplace behind it. So that's a problem. We've got to fix that. So what we need to do is we need to blur the video layers in order to do that. And of course, we have two video layers here. So rather than apply the filter to each video layer, I'm going to only apply the filter once. Now, by the way, uh, in order to apply a filter effect to a video layer in Photoshop, you do have to convert the video layer into a smart object. Smart objects are really, really useful. And I have uh, an episode of The Fix that was recorded, oh, I think back in September, late September, maybe early October. Uh, the entire episode was dedicated to smart objects. So if you're interested in learning more about smart objects, go and look that up. Um, I can't recall the episode name offhand. It might have been episode 32 or 34 or something like that. So what I'm going to do to apply the filter to the two video layers is I'm going to create a new group. I'll click on the new group icon here. And I'm going to move that group down just above the video groups. And I'm just going to rename that. Call it video layers. And I'm going to place each of the video groups inside there. So I'm going to click on one and command or control click on the other one to select both of them and then just drag them up into that group. And I'll close that group and I'll right click on it and I'll choose convert to smart object. So now we have two video layers, one that has a keyframe effect on it placed inside a layer group that has been turned into a smart object. Pretty cool. And now that it is a smart object, we can apply that filter. So I'm going to go up to the filter menu. And there is a choice here at the top of the filter menu which says Blur Gallery. So whenever you apply a filter effect, the most recent filter effect shows up here at the top of the list. If I was to just choose this now, or use the shortcut of Command F or Control F, it would apply that same filter using the exact same settings. But if you want to see the filter dialog before you apply it, just to sort of double check that the settings are going to be OK, hold down the option of the Alt key as you choose this choice. You can also add that into the keyboard shortcut and do Command Option F or Control Alt F to get the same effect. So you can see it's now opened up the blur shape. The blur amount is exactly the same. And now you can see over here on the door that we are blurring the video. So that's all I need to do there. I'm going to click OK. And let's press the play button or in this case, the space bar on the keyboard and see how this looks. Again, pay attention to what's happening with the blue line of that RAM preview. Because we're blurring a video, which is a lot more processor intensive here, it's going to go a lot slower until it builds up that RAM preview. So you can see it's, it's really creeping along now. And, and that is actually a um, kind of a word of warning to you. 
uh, if you are applying filter effects to video, it has to apply that filter effect to every single frame of the video. So it is going to be a lot slower to preview the effects initially and until Photoshop builds up the RAM preview. And also, if you're doing this with a regular video project, you know, not an, uh, an animated GIF cinemagraph, when you render out your video, it'll take a lot longer to render out. Of course, a lot of this depends on you know, a variety of factors, the usual suspects that, that affect these things, um, you know, the speed of your computer, how much RAM you have, how much processor you have, how much scratch disk space you have, um, how complex the video is, how complicated the filter effect is, the size, all of those things are going to affect how long the render or the RAM previewing is going to take. And now you can see that it has built up the RAM preview and it's, you know, scooting along at a nice little pace and the blur of the reflection of the fire is looking pretty good. Okay, we are done here with the basic effects, so now it's time to save this in a format that we can share out on the web. So I'm gonna go up to the File menu in Photoshop CC, and I'm gonna come down to Export, Save for Web Legacy. Now in earlier versions of Photoshop, so Photoshop CS6, and possibly even earlier versions of Photoshop CC, uh, Save for Web is just going to appear out here in the main uh, file menu, but in Photoshop CC 2015, it does appear here in the export menu, which is inside the file menu. Now, if you have added uh, blurring effects to smart object video layers, as I have done here, it may take it a little bit of time to render the preview into the Save for Web dialog. In fact, as I speak this here, I can see that it's kind of flashing around in the background here. And that's because it's having to, to go through and, and frame by frame apply that blur effect so that it can give us a preview that we can see in here. So just realize that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, when you're applying a blurring effect to a video layer, or in this case here, to two video layers, uh, it is fairly processor intensive and it, it could take a little bit of time to give you your initial preview here. So I'm right now in a two up view, uh, which is going to compare the optimized to the original. I'm just going to get the space bar and arrange this to where I can see the Nutcracker's face. And right now I'm using the GIF format, or GIF if you want to call it that. Uh, I always had trouble referring to it as GIF just because that makes me think of the brand of peanut butter. But the, uh, the person who came up with this format says that GIF is the way you should pronounce it, so uh, I guess they should know. I'm using the adaptive uh, color reduction algorithm. So it is adapting colors from the actual image. I'm using a diffusion dither. And right now I have the color set to 256. And it's doing a pretty good job here uh, of that. However, the size is too big. It's uh, coming in at about 9.2 megabytes, which is definitely too big. Now, in terms of size, you know, if you're just going to be viewing this on a computer and not over an internet connection, uh, the size doesn't really matter because the file is right there on your hard drive and it's going to play right away and it's going to look great. But if you want it to load reasonably fast on a web page, uh, you do want to be concerned about the file size. So the first thing I'm going to do is make this smaller. I'm just going to cut this by 50%, and I'll press the Enter key. And again, it may take a little bit of time for that effect to be applied to the image. Because in my case here, I have that blurring filter, which is having to be reapplied here as it resizes the image. If you have a regular video that you haven't applied any fancy blurring effects to, it's not going to be a problem. Okay, it's done, and we can see that sizing it down to 50% is now dropped it from, you know, over 9 megabytes just to about 2.3 megabytes. So that's more in line with uh, what I would expect to see from something like this to be placed on a website. Obviously, smaller would load faster, but for now, I'm going to say that, you know, that, that's probably okay. Of course, I could always try to uh, reduce the colors. Maybe I could go down to 64 colors and it would be okay. Uh, I don't think I'm going to gain that much based on some previous tests that I did with this image earlier. You know, it went down from, you know, 2.35 megabytes down to 2.12 megabytes. So I wasn't really getting that much bang for my buck, and I do think that the color looks a lot better like this. Now, one thing that's pretty cool is that down in the lower left corner of the Save for Web dialog, there's a button that allows us to preview this in a web browser. So if I click on that, 
it will open up a web browser and show us what that looks like. Ah, except it stopped. That's because I forgot to set one option here. Go back to the Save for Web dialog, and down at the bottom, there's a looping option, and I can set that to forever. And I will now click the Preview in Web Browser button again. And now it's going to give us that looping preview, and we can see what it's going to look like when people see it on a web page. So that looks pretty good. I'm going to come back here to the Save for Web dialog and just click the Save button. And we'll save that out. And of course, the cool thing about the way that I've structured the layered master Photoshop file here is that everything is non-destructive, and I can always go back and adjust things later if I wanted to. For instance, such as the, the amount of blur. I'm noticing here that I'm getting, you know, a little bit more blurring on the uh, hair than uh, perhaps I would like, so I could always go back and modify that by just double-clicking on the blur gallery filter here in the layers panel for the video layers, and it's going to open up the blur, and I can modify that so that the hair is not being blurred quite as much. And then save that out again. Of course, I have to then re-render a new copy using the uh, Save for Web Legacy dialog. Well, I hope that you found that project interesting and that some of the things that I shared there give you some ideas as to how you might use some of those same techniques or similar techniques on some of your own Photoshop projects, whether they are cinemagraphs or video projects or even just still images. And if you've never tried making a cinemagraph before, I hope that, uh, that this episode has inspired you to maybe go out and give it a try uh, and see what you can come up with. And, you know, of course, you can apply some of these other Photoshop skills, like I showed in this episode, to, you know, take your cinemagraphs just up a notch to, to uh, a new level, to make them a little bit different and uh, a, something a little bit more elaborate than straight out of the camera. In terms of um, creating an effective cinemagraph, I think that, you know, once you get past the basic dance steps of how they're created, uh, if you put a little bit of thought into it, uh, maybe a little bit of pre-planning, you can come up with some things that are pretty cool. Uh, some of the most effective ones that I've seen um, almost suggest a hint of a story or a little bit of mystery, and they're just so um, elegant and en enigmatic that uh, it's a pleasure to watch them, you know, and just sort of you know, let my mind spin out and, and almost sort of create tales and stories that are suggested by, by the image and that subtle motion in the image. So we have a new year coming up, um, 2016. Happy New Year to you. Thanks very much for watching The Fix. I do appreciate that. Remember, you can always subscribe to the audio version of this program on iTunes, and you can watch the video version, as well as find a downloadable audio version on the website, thisweekinphoto.com slash the fix. And while you're there at thisweekinphoto.com, there are plenty of other photography-related podcasts to check out, so do make time for that. I will see you next year on the next episode of The Fix. I'm Sean Duggan. Thanks again for watching. Catch you later.